the title of my lecture is The Future of Manual Therapy. And this is something which I think is important because on social media often, manual therapy gets quite a bad rap. So um, people will often say that we've moved past the stage when manual therapy has been useful. That was in the 1990s. And most of the research now comes out against the effectiveness of manual therapy and should we therefore consider using it at all? Well hopefully I can address some of those things uh, in this lecture. Let's start off by looking at some basics then. So what is manual therapy? Well essentially it is a hands-on approach. So anything where we touch the patient, anything where we put our hands on the patient can be considered as manual therapy. So we've got a variety of different things that could be described within in that area. So massage, soft tissue manipulation, connective tissue techniques, myofascial release. So these are all things which we would say are aimed at the soft tissues. And then we've got more joint-based techniques, so joint mobilizations, joint manipulations, predominantly aimed at the, the, um, the synovial joints particularly. And then we've got things such as mobilization of neural tissue, mobilization of the nervous system itself, visceral mobilization, strain, counter strain, so working on, on muscle reflexes. So essentially we can say that manual therapy, broadly speaking, at least for, from this perspective of, of this lecture, we can divide into two things. So we've got those which will, where, where the aim is predominantly to affect the soft tissues, and those where the aim is predominantly to affect the joints. Now, an obvious point is that the contact we make with the patient, with our hands, is through the skin. So anything we do will affect the skin, it will affect the, sub the subcutaneous um, tissues, the muscles, the joints. So right from the start, we have an inherent problem that we as a profession have got into the habit of describing manual therapy techniques as though they were specific as though we were manual surgeons, if you like. So in the same way as a surgeon can operate and take out a piece of disc, you know, we give the impression that with our hands, we can focus on an individual tissue. And this may or may not be the case, but I think it is the, the um, public belief that that's, that's what we are claiming, at least. So if we look at these um, techniques, then we can start off with manipulation because manipulation is often a word which is familiar to a patient. Um, they, they know that there are professions such as osteopathy, chiropractic, physio, etc., where manipulation is used very often and, and, and it can all almost be um, a question of defining the profession. So what do we mean by manipulation? Well, we've already mentioned soft tissue manipulation. We can argue that a manipulation of the soft tissue is, isn't, isn't a manipulation at all, that, that manipulation needs to be something which is affecting the joint. Although clearly what we've already said is that both, both things will be affected by whatever technique we do. But in terms of our definition, manipulation tends to be defined as a high velocity, low amplitude action. So in other words, it's something which is quite fast and it's a fairly small movement. And when we do that, there will be a number of different phases. And those phases have been defined in um, a, a couple of books and a couple of pa um, papers. So I think, you know, there's more clarity on this now. So we have to prepare the patient and prepare ourselves. So that, that has been, you know, described as an orientation phase. Then we need to take up the tissue slack, which we could call preload. And then we do the manipulation itself, which is, a, is often the thrust technique. And then both we as therapists and the patient 
needs to recover from that. So we've got that resolution. So we've got those three sort of um, areas, the, the, those four areas where we say, well, OK, we're going to get into the position. We're going to take up the slack. We're going to thrust and then we're going to recover. And very often when a manipulation is done, the patient will expect some sort of sound, some sort of release, some sort of click, some sort of pop, either heard or felt. And we know that when we do this, you know, there can be, as with any treatment, inherent dangers because we are putting in force to, to the body. And, you know, the, the dangers of manipulation can be in any part of the body, but particularly we're talking about the cervical spine, the upper part of the cervical spine, the suboccipital area, where we know that there have been um, cases of neurological damage and in some instances cases of stroke, cases of death. So this technique is, you know, not without danger, but perhaps the danger is more recognised in manual therapy than it may be in other things that we do. So there will be dangers taking somebody to a swimming pool, dangers taking somebody to the gym, but perhaps that's not as obvious to the, to the uh, patient simply because it's not on the whole described in the media. So that's our manipulation then, and mobilization is sometimes seen as a, as a sort of a, um, a partner to manipulation, but a more considerate partner and a lower, lower energy partner. So we can use it on any area of the body, but on the whole, mobilization has been described for the spine and the periphery. And most of these techniques have been popularized by one or two individuals who, you know, spent a long time in their lives describing these techniques. And, and so they've become synonymous with those. So much as, you know, a search engine is known as Google and a, and a vacuum cleaner is known as a Hoover, mobilizations are often described as Maitland mobilizations and, and, and um, manipulations can be Syriax techniques or osteopathic techniques or, or whatever. So they, they, they um, are often, um, the technique itself is described, but it's often assumed that that technique will be used when a particular name is, is described. So mobilizations were um, initially described as um, graded. So a manipulation would be a grade five and a mobilization would be anything less than that. And the aim of that was to say, well, we can repeat this. So if we're doing a grade four manipulation or mobilization, uh, grade two mobilization, we should be able to repeat that and we should be able to pass that on to the next therapist who should be able to do something similar. And there have been aims to try to standardize this. So one what is the use of um, either pain or stiffness as the predominant measure. When does that pain occur? When does that resistance occur? What does it feel like to the therapist carrying that out? And again, can we repeat that? So if we're doing a particular grade of mobilization and we're um, doing it for a particular resistance, that should be repeatable. And so mobilization and manipulation have traditionally been described using biomechanical principles. So physiological movements, accessory movements, convex concave rules, open pack, closed packs. So these are all biomechanical principles and they are, you know, not, not wrong, but they certainly are limited because these don't necessarily take on board the requirements of the individual patient. So why should we use manual therapy then? We know that, you know, there's been a lot of training in the past on manual therapy, a lot of courses, a lot of books. And if we choose to use it, is it something which is useful? Now, when you look at social media, you would get the impression that manual therapy is not useful. It shouldn't be used because it's taking up time away from other techniques 
which are more useful. However, we are an evidence-based profession, and when we look at the evidence, and the evidence is very strong, so these are systematic reviews, meta-analyses, um, randomized control trials, we see that there is good evidence for manual therapy. I'll draw your attention to this paper by Kerry et al. It's actually in press at the moment, but they do a nice review of the evidence behind manual therapy. And essentially, the conclusions that they come up is that systematic reviews show that manual therapy has similar effect sizes to other approaches which are recommended. So other approaches such as pain neuroscience education, exercise therapy, which have been um, recommended by specialist bodies, such as NICE, do so because of the effect size, so how, how effective a particular technique is. So when we're measuring a technique, we can say, well, it, it, does it change something significantly? And that would be a statistical term. An effect size is a statistical term which measures how useful that particular um, treatment is to, to a patient. So you, you would compare it to other forms of treatment. So you might say, for example, um, the effect size is you know, four for manual therapy, the effect size is four and a half for paracetamol, the effect size is et cetera, et cetera. So you can compare between treatments. So they have similar effect sizes. So when they're not better than other techniques, but they're as good, manual therapy is as good as other techniques which have already been recommended. Secondly, when we do these other techniques, so if we take exercise as an example, if we package those in with manual therapy at some stage in the treatment, the effect is better and the effect is more cost effective. So it would seem that you're not just getting A, which would be the exercise, and B, which would be the manual therapy. You don't just get A and B combined. You end up with a C, which is something which is better than the two individual, um, the individual treatments. So manual therapy then um, is less costly and more beneficial than other activities. And again, that's not me saying that. These are authoritative papers, and the particular references are in this, um, in Kerry's paper. He's got about 40 different references in there. He goes through all the various different evidence. Um, so, so we have evidence that manual therapy is useful. So if it is useful then, and we're going to continue to use it, should we be changing it? And, you know, the, the, the answer to that question and the thrust of this lecture really is that, yes, we should. So traditionally, manual therapy has been described in a set way. So if you look at textbooks by Maitland or Syriax or Caldenborn or, or any of the, the sort of major individuals, you will normally find a thread which runs through them, which is that clinician-centered assessment is important. So I'm, I'm measuring something, I'm mobilizing this joint, and I'm measuring it, and I'm feeling something. And I can say, well, okay, Mrs. Jones, you know, there's a little bit of stiffness here. I know you you said that you you didn't have any pain now, and it was fine when you walk your dog, but I'm still feeling a little bit of stiffness, so we're going to give you another couple of treatments. Okay, so the implication being that I'm feeling something that the patient is not aware of. So a little bit like taking an x-ray and you're saying, well, you know, you said your knee was okay, but actually when I've taken the x-ray, I can see some osteophytes. Okay. Secondly, then we're saying, well, okay, well, if we can feel these different things, we're basing it on the fact that if there is a structural change that would be responsible for the patient's symptoms. So it would be driving the patient's symptoms. And this is a pathoanatomical reasoning. And this is what is used in surgery. So you have low back pain and you have pain going right into your foot on your right leg. 
I have taken a scan and I can see a disc lesion with a protrusion on the right side at L5. Therefore, I, as a clinician, assume that your symptoms are coming from that disc bulge and therefore the treatment should be aimed at that disc bulge. That is patho-anatomical reasoning. But of course it may be that that person's had a disc bulge for years, but they, their pain has only come in the last couple of weeks. Or it might be that if you were to scan a thousand backs, that you would see similar changes in most people, and some have got pain, and some have not. So pathoanatomical reasoning is correct up to a point, but it doesn't necessarily give us the whole picture. And the final assumption of traditional manual therapy is that there is something special about what we do and something which takes time to learn. As we've taken that time and we gain experience, we become better. So we've been doing something for 10 years, so therefore we will get a better result than somebody who's just been doing it for a couple of weeks. But the evidence doesn't support that. Secondly, we can say, well, because of these magic hands, I can feel that there is a change at L3, but there isn't a change at L4. So therefore, I'm going to direct my technique at L3. And that is going to give a better response. But again, the evidence doesn't support that. So if we apply a non-specific form of manual therapy, we will get similar results. And an experienced practitioner compared to a non-experienced practitioner applying manual therapy will get similar results. Now, there's a rider on that. I'm not describing patient assessment here. I'm describing the actual technique itself. Okay, so that's what we've done traditionally. If we're going to move forwards, we need to change. And that change has been entitled contemporary manual therapy. So, you know, integrated or contemporary things that, you know, where we're saying, well, okay, we've got all of these threads of manual therapy, which we've built up over the years. What we're going to try to do is put them all together, take away all the things which don't work, keep hold of all the things which do work, and we should have a, a, a method to move forwards. So contemporary manual therapy then is going to be more person-centered rather than clinician-centered. That doesn't mean it's one or the other, but there's going to be an increased focus on the patient and the clinician rather than simply the clinician themselves. And the reasoning behind that is that our traditional um, method of reasoning in, in, in therapy has become biopsychosocial. So traditionally, we had a medical model which was focused on biology. There is a structural problem which we will correct. And then if we do correct that, everything else should fall in place. We know now that the biology of the tissues, the structure of the tissues is important, but equally the psychology of the patient and the social factors affecting that patient are important as well. So we are using a biopsychosocial approach for all of our other treatments, or we should be doing. So let's not let's not make manual therapy different. We'll use a biopsychosocial reasoning approach to manual therapy. And so rather than being specific to a single tissue with a single technique, we're going to try to judge the result on the whole person. So the, 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 the our whole person approach. So can we make that person feel better in themselves rather than simply pain free. All right, so let's let's just dissect this a little bit. So 
clinician-centered assessment then? What is that and what have we used in the past? Well, we model it on routine imaging. And we know that routine imaging, particularly for low back pain, is not something which is useful. So um, we know that lesions are often as common in patients who don't have symptoms as those who do have symptoms. So you might say, well, OK, but surely by imaging um, we are being safe. And the, the parallel with that would be to say, well, in manual therapy, surely by screening everybody's posture, we're being safe. The downside is that that type of routine examination, routine imaging, can lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So I'm going to remove that disc bulge. So I remove the disc bulge, and the patient's still got pain. So it's it's there was the, the, the diagnosis was incorrect because it was overdiagnosis, and that led to overtreatment. And the same could be true here. So we say, well, I feel a little bit of stiffness in your lumbar spine. Now, I know that you said you're pain free, but I just want you to have three more treatments until we can get rid of that stiffness. Over treatment. So we've treated too much. Now, you may again say, well, surely that, you know, there is a bit of stiffness. So if that stiffness had been maintained. Would the patient not have come back again with, with a further condition? But what is the opportunity which has been missed? We've got three treatment sessions when we could do something else. We don't need to do manual therapy. We could engage them with exercise therapy. We could talk about lifestyle. We could do all sorts of other things which may have a better effect. OK. So the clinical guidance no longer recommends routine imaging for non-traumatic low back pain. And I would argue that the same is true of manual therapy. But on the whole, we don't need to do as much individual assessment of individual joints. There will be times when that's important, but on the whole, it isn't. In the same way as if somebody falls off a horse, you do want an x-ray because there could be a fracture. But if it's non-traumatic, you, you, you probably don't need that. OK, so pathoanatomical lesions then, so things related to structure in manual therapy have become alignment faults. So I've assessed you and this is what I have found. I'm going to correct that. You may not be aware of what's happening, but just trust me. Yeah. But that approach doesn't, doesn't seem to work. And that leads on to specialist palpation. So I'm, I'm assessing something and I'm comparing it against an optimal. However, there is no general agreement as to what is normal and what is optimal. So we, we lack reference standards. So we can say, well, I found this little bit of stiffness. But actually, I found it on this person here as well. And this person's got pain and he doesn't have any stiffness. Palpation sensation that we receive is unlikely to be related to tissue changes themselves alone. So it might be the way the person is lying, the thoughts going through the person's head, all sorts of things which will relate to what we feel and things which are happening to us as therapists. And so there is, on the whole, poor reliability of specialist palpation. So we either need to increase that reliability or we need to say, well, it's, it's not useful. When we come to person-centered assessment, then we can say, well, things such as case history become more important. So not just research, which would be, which would be quantitative, but how patients actually relax, react, and that would be our qualitative. So listening to experienced practitioners is now, you know, which was once said to be deeply unscientific, is now coming to the fore and saying, well, OK, um, we're not quite sure how this technique works, but these guys have done it 200 times and they say this is the result that we're getting. 
Now we're not necessarily going to believe them, but what we are going to do is look into it. Okay, so it, it recognizes the complexity of the therapy, the, therapeutic encounter. So in other words, as that person comes into the room, we examine them, we strip them down, we do a technique. Previously, we focused on what technique that was, what happened. Now we need to expand that and say, well, the change could be because of the reassurance that you gave them for the examination. It could be what you said as a therapist. It could be the fact that they're walking into the room and it's light and it's bright and you know, there's a huge sigh of relief that they've actually got through the queue to see you. So that is complex and we need to be able to recognise that. And one of the ways of recognising that is to measure it qualitatively. And so we can use measures, and one of those measures are patient reported outcome measures. And there are a variety of them, so they, broadly speaking, um, fall into different, different categories. So how do you feel? So generalised well-being, something which is condition specific. So this one I said, the SPADI, so the shoulder pain and disability index, we don't use it for knees, you only use it for shoulders. Why? Because it's been validated for those. And then things which are individualised. So you say, well, OK, tell me what's wrong with you. Well, my leg hurts and when I go downstairs, I find it quite difficult. And when I bend over and pick my two-year-old up, it's quite difficult. OK, so stairs, lifting your two-year-old and pain in the leg are your important things. How would you score those on 1 to 10? And what I'm doing then is I'm going to measure those before and afterwards. So I'm using something known as a measure yourself medical outcome profile or MIMOP. So those are things which are simply referring to the person from the biopsychosocial um, perspective. The generic ones are simply saying, how do you feel? And the specific ones are onto the joint. So we've got a couple of measures that we can use. So these are our pathoanatomical reasonings then. So things such as disc changes, joints being repositioned, changes in adhesions, etc., etc. And most of these theories lack evidence or have been contested. So they're, they're not consistent. When we talk about tissue specificity, the same is true. So, you know, just going through these, traditional manual therapy claims that joints were moved individually or gliding maybe direction specific. So, you know, AP glide, PA glide, etc, etc. But we know that there have been several different papers which show us that that's not the case. So this first one, um, uh, it, it talks about this, the skin fascia interface and, and what, what we are feeling with our skin, not reflecting what is under the skin. So we are not x-ray machines and what we can feel with our hands is fairly limited. The manual therapy techniques that we are using are unlikely to generate sufficient force to move the tissues that we're aiming for. So when we're looking at a facet joint and we're, and we're pushing or pulling, there will be some force which will be transmitted to that joint, but it may not be clinically significant. And when we're looking at manual therapy close to a pathology, it may not give us better results. So, you know, there are, again, patient, um, different papers. So treating the thoracic spine in this particular patient showed that we could reduce the symptoms in the cervical spine. Um, so, again, there must be something else happening. Now, the, the interesting thing is with that particular paper that the patients improved. So the hands-on technique certainly worked, but the tissue specificity wasn't important. So we come back down to this interaction between the patient and the therapist. So the therapeutic alliance, which on the whole may be less skilled and less specific than we had originally thought. OK, so we can um, filter manual therapy down then into 
two things that we're aiming for in, in, you know, traditionally. So we are looking predominantly at pain and stiffness. And in this Kerry paper, there's quite a nice um, definition of what manual therapy is. Therapeutic intent is usually to reduce pain and improve movement, thus facilitating return to function and improved quality of life. So we are aiming at pain and stiffness, but for a very good reason. That is to improve the way that a person acts in day-to-day -day activity, which would be part of our social part, and to improve how they feel. So that would be the psychological aspects. So where we're aiming predominantly for pain, we would probably do lower grades, oscillation type movements, used traditionally, so grade one and two. When we're aiming more for stiffness, we're going to be putting more force into that joint and that, jo that force may be from the therapist or it may be from the patient, but they would be higher grades and they would be towards the limit in that patient's ra range of motion. And when we look at that and how um, the, the joints move, we know that there are certain ways that joints move because of their shape. So we talk about osteokinematics, the shape of the bone, and arthrokinematics, the shapes of the bones and the soft tissues. And there will be certain things which happen to joints. So, for example, we can talk about movements that the patient can do themselves, flexion and extension, and we can term those as physiological movements. We can talk about movements that the joint is capable of, such as gliding movements, over which we have no control, but which, which would occur as part of other movements. We can call those accessory movements. So we know that there are certain ways that, that joints move. However, when we extend that to rules, so typically concave convex rules, we start to have problems in that we can't necessarily predict accurately what is going to happen. So there have been several papers looked at looking at the reliability of convex con, uh, concave rules um, and saying, well, if I do this technique on this patient, this will happen. That, that is not the case. But what we can say is, well, the joint itself will move in a certain way, and it might be that we need to address the flexion, but not the extension, the glide, but not the spin, etc., etc., on that individual patient. But there's less reliability between patients. So we're talking here about accessory movements or micro movements where we may not necessarily need a great amount of force. So we talk about roll, glide, spin, traction, compression. So all of these things, we could, um, we could impart some force to the joint, which would be directional. And that force could either come from the therapist or it could come from the patient themselves. When we then look at the effects of manual therapy and we say, well, OK, how are, are, how are we achieving this effect? It seems to come down to a few things. First, the click or pop, the cavitation, is not important, doesn't seem to be important. Um, it can occur above and below the area, and so it's not necessarily specific. So um, in the same way as things like twitch responses have been found not to be important uh, in terms of uh, trigger point work and needling, um, cavitation is you know is a byproduct of manipulation it may occur it may not but it's not necessarily important it is likely that the tissue change that we're seeing with the manual therapy that we're doing is through an alteration of muscle stiffness now that would be different obviously if you're doing a manipulation under anesthesia um, so for a frozen shoulder um, but what we're doing is working on the on the soft tissues through the skin and so muscle stiffness changes may may occur. There is 
a short-term reduction in tone after after a, a manual therapy or particularly after a manipulation um, and how important that is, is is difficult to say but it certainly occurs and so we're looking now at a neurophysiological model to replace the traditional manual therapy model. So we're not now assuming that we are in fact directly moving a joint, but we're instrumental in the way that that joint is moving for the patient. So manual therapy then it can be considered as a stimulus. So a sensory stimulus, a noxious stimulus, which initiates various different changes in the body. So a cascade of neurophysiological uh, reactions which give rise to pain reduction, analgesia. Subjects who receive manual therapy do have altered biomarkers in their bloodstream. So we know that it's having an effect. We can't argue that it's not having an effect. We know that the way that the muscle reacts is lesson so so-called temporal summation where you you build up uh, the contraction of the muscle over a period of time is lessened after manual therapy so it's likely that muscle tone could be affected and we can measure that with uh, in, in an experimental situation at least um, measuring um, a laboratory equivalent of the stretch reflex which is called the Hoffman reflex the H reflex and again we know that that is reduced after manual therapy and we also know that the representation in the brain of the body part changes. So cortical excitability, cerebral blood flow, these things all change after manual therapy. So clearly we're doing something. And what we're also doing is to encourage movement post-manual therapy. And when we do that, we can often get what's known as non-associative learning. So we know when we do um, any movement, we put several sub-movements together. And that um, series of sub-movements, so if I throw a ball, for example, I need to do something with my hand, something with my elbow, something with my shoulder, something with my stance. And when I put that all together, we create a body schema, so a pattern of that particular movement. Now the argument is that when we have pain that's, that schema is changed and we need to change that back and, one, and, and that would be non-associative learning. So what we're trying to do is to get the patient to move more correctly without pain or in the presence of less pain to, to break the association between the movement and the pain. All right, so we're looking then at the physiological aspects of manual therapy as predominantly being something to do with pain, something to do with mechanics of movement in some form, and something to do with motor control, the way that we actually move. And when we look at this in terms of pain, just to quickly sort of remind ourselves that we have you know, the way that we receive pain is not through a continuous nerve. So, you know, the nerves from our hand, for example, go to the spinal cord, form a synapse that goes to the brain stem, forms a synapse, goes to the higher center. And so we have opportunities to modify that signal. When that signal gets to the brain, it's going to cause a number of different changes, a number of different patterns, and that pattern can change in the presence of pain, and we can change it back to a degree in manual therapy. What we can also do is stimulate the, the release of natural painkillers, so so-called diffuse noxious inhibitory control, or descending inhibition from the brain. So that's a, a whole other, other subject. But just to say, that we can alter this response in the brain. So this is an example of altering the, the response with exercise, and it's been shown that we can alter the response with manual therapy. Um, mechanical effects of manual therapy, we see mechanical effects um, on uh, other things, such as bone, for example, and it's down to mechanotransduction. And mechanotransduction is a the way the body reacts by generating a series of signals 
which are as a result of our input of, of force. Um, and then motor learning effects, again, we can learn from um, you sort of uh, the way that we, c we teach um, uh, skilled movements. And one of the things that we can learn from that is a, a particular theory called the optimal theory, um, which uh, is um, a, a principle of how best to teach a skilled movement. And the interesting thing about this, and this is not that relevant for manual therapy, but um, what, what we do know from this approach is that we want some sort of expectation so if we, if we say, well, how does that apply to manual therapy? Well, the fact that we're saying to the patient, we can help you and it's going to get better, creates that positive expectation. There should be a patient choice. So the patient should be instrumental in, in uh, determining what they like in terms, of our, in terms of our manual therapy. We're looking at promoting an external focus of control. So, so this person throwing the javelins wouldn't be encouraged to think about their shoulder, for example, they'd be encouraged to think about the line that they're throwing the javelin towards. And so with manual therapy, we are creating an external focus. So the person is in pain, but they're focusing more on our hands. So it's, it's an external focus. All right, so let's us move on and say, well, you know, what what is it that we're going to, how we are, are we going to modify things? Well, we can modify things by looking at the manual therapy and saying, well, what, what did we do? Well, we looked at the direction of movement, was it A, P or P, A? The strength of movement, was it a grade? And the location of movement, was it on the knee, was it on the hip? And we can take these and we can and we move them still further. So we can we can step away. And again, I've taken this from from the Kerry paper. And what they do, they've come up with a framework. You know, Nottingham framework because it was done at Nottingham University. And they say, well, you know, if we put all of the manual therapy techniques together, I mean, all of the manual therapists, and we say, well, what do they do, which is similar? We can say, well, it needs to be safe. It needs to be comfortable. And it needs to be efficient. So safety of the patient and the therapist, comfort of the patient and the therapist, and efficiency in that the patient's symptoms are improving. Okay, so if we look at that and we can say, well, you know, what position do we need to do? Well, you know, traditionally you're lying on your front when you do, you do manual therapy, but is that comfortable for the patient? Is that comfortable for the therapists? So I can't treat you lying on your front today because I don't have a treatment couch and we're, we're at a 5k run and you're lying on the floor. So the consideration of my choice of treatment is for myself. It's not safe for me. It might be that the patient says, well, I, I can't lie on my front. I've got a breathing problem. OK, so whatever treatment you're doing, have you been trained to do it in sitting? Have you been trained to do it in lying? Can you do it in sideline? So can we modify that? When we look at the therapist then, what is the strain on the therapist? I had one of my therapists come to me recently and said, oh, I don't think I can do any more massages. My thumbs really hurt. And you think, well, to get to that stage where she's never said anything about it, and perhaps, you know, I, I, I was at fault because I'd never asked her about it. Um, you know, we have to consider that as a safety issue for the therapist. So we can't go and spend 30 years mobilising joint by going dink, 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 dink with our thumbs if we end up with arthritic thumbs um, and, and, you know, no benefit. So we need that safety of the therapist and we need some form of safety of the condition itself. And I mentioned to you about, about experienced therapists and non-experienced therapists. One of the most important safety uh, considerations, of course, is our patient examination and identification of red flags. So we're not routinely going to use manual therapy. We're going to examine the patient first. And it may be that manual therapy forms part of that examination or maybe not. 
When we come to comfort then, again, it's both the patient and the therapist. And on the whole, I think in the past, we have focused very much on, on the patient. We're teaching students and we sort of say, oh, well, make the patient comfortable and do this, do this. And think about the poor old student, you know, you know what, what is suitable for you. So we can think of something physical and say, well, are your hands the right shape? You know, if you've got a hyperextending elbow, if you've got a dicky thumb, are you tall enough, etc., etc. But also with talking about emotional comfort for the therapist and the patient. Does the patient really need to strip down to their underpants when they're six stone overweight and you as a therapist are a 20 year old female? They might be embarrassed, they might not be emotionally comfortable to do that and that will have an effect on the treatment as well. Equally, are you emotionally comfortable? Are you using a technique where well, I work in this clinic and they tell me I, you, I need to use this technique, but I don't think it really works. Well, it's unlikely to work well with you if you don't believe in it, if, if, if you're not on its side, as it were. So emotional comfort is important. State of dress can be important. You know, social culture um, factors come into this. You know, does the person want to undress? Are they comfortable with a with a male therapist, etc., etc.? So all of these things can be important. If we're applying force from a therapist, or if we're applying external force in in a gym situation. That we're going to start and then we're going to complete that movement. We need to be comfortable throughout that whole movement. So stress on the particular body part, stress on the rest of the body. Can we change things? Can we adapt them to make them more comfortable? And finally, we've got this thing called embody cognition, which is where we say, well, whatever you're thinking, is reflected in your body. So typically we could say, well, you know, if you're very stressed, your shoulders might be up here. And we, we sort of say, well, you look very stressed today, Peter, you know, what's wrong with you? Well, that's embodied cognition. So when a person is in pain, it may well be that the, the technique we use is the effect is through embodied cognition. So we simply change the position and they feel more comfortable. And it's not it's not the technique, whether it's a grade one or a grade four that I'm actually doing, it's the position I'm putting them into. So we need to be open for that. And finally, efficiency. We want to get the maximum therapeutic benefit for the minimum waste of time, of our effort, of cost. So, you know, in that example where I said, well, we, you know, we think things are stiff, you're just going to have three more treatments. And that is a waste. It's a waste of those treatments. Either don't do it at all, in which case you've saved time and you can see another patient. The patient has saved money. The, the health service has saved money. Or you say, well, I'm, you know, well, I'm going to do three more treatments, but I'm not going to use manual therapy. I'm going to use something else. So the patient mentioned to me that they wanted to go jogging but they haven't got any training shoes. And I'm going to just spend a bit of time talking about the sort of training shoes that they should use, the sort of thing they should do when they start jogging. And that would probably be better time spent than spent on manual therapy. We need to make the therapy integral to an education program. So this is not something where we say, well, okay, you go into that room, you have your manual therapy, you go into that room, we're going to discuss pain, you go into that room, we're going to discuss diet. While we're doing this manual therapy, while we've enhanced our therapeutic alliance with the patient, that is an opportunity for education. You know, you thought that by moving your back, you would make it worse. Now, I'm moving your back with this gentle technique. How does the pain feel? Well, it's certainly not worse. And how does the pain feel now? Well, it's a little bit better. OK, so it would appear then a small amount of movement of the right type makes your pain back better. So we've now swapped that belief round from movement makes me worse and I'm going to avoid it to movement can make me better if I do the right thing. 
that's you know that could have taken a whole hour's lecture to get that through to them and now we've got them through through their experience okay so we're looking at um, using some self-care making the patient uh, self uh, you know uh, to contribute to the treatments themselves and to so enhance self-efficacy and that will of course depend on the patient so some people just want to lie there and do and they're not prepared to to do anything and we need to recognize that that that, that is the case you know we swap things around and we say well can i appear you know can i appeal to the patient differently is it the way that i'm i'm doing something but you know some patients love being involved and other patients don't so we're not going to say okay you know i've given you two treatments and you're discharged that's it. That's all you have if they are not going to engage in their own health care. But equally, we're not going to give them 10 treatments if they say, oh, I, I, I did that myself and uh, it feels better now. You know, they, they are self self um, uh, resilient, if you like. So we can we can do that. So we're, we're looking at um, making the treatment efficient rather than just the the manual therapy. And so we can say, well, within within those three things of efficiency, comfort and safety, there's an overarching um, aspect of things. And one is communication. So how are we communicating with that patient? Well, firstly, we're touching them. That is a form of communication. But things such as active listening, verbal and nonverbal. So I'm not actively listening if I'm typing away in the computer. Yes, Mrs. Jones. OK, yes. That's not active listening, is it? Diagnosis as a shared endeavour. Well, I think it could be this. How does that sound to you? Well, you're giving me a chance to contribute to that. And very often you'll get more information. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. It could be coming from my, my, uh, my back. Um, but do you think the fact that I dropped a flower pot on my foot has anything to do with it? Well, they didn't tell you that to start with, but now it's coming through. So we're moving on in general from unhelpful beliefs through our communication. So rather than saying to them, this is not coming from your back, we are getting to that conclusion through the experience of the treatment and, and experiential learning rather than, rather than, you know, traditional um, non-experiential uh, learning can often be more effective. Motivational interviewing techniques, so we're reflecting on things, we're summarising things, that's a particular approach that we don't need to go on to now but some of you will be aware of that. Um, things such as touch and communication, consent, these are all sort of legal things but also um, you know the fact that touch itself, we are as therapists are assuming is soothing but it might not be it might be alienating so somebody doesn't like being touched you know makes my skin crawl it may be the case you know are we big enough are we open enough to be able to say i'm not going to result with this patient because this patient doesn't like me they don't they don't like me touching them so therefore i'm going to refer on it's going to happen there will be cases where you know you, you, you simply don't get on with your therapist and we need to be open for that. We also need to be open, you know, going right back to phase one on the clinical reasoning of saying, well, how did we come to the decision that we're going to use this treatment? Are we biased towards manual therapy or are we biased against manual therapy? So we need to mentally step back and say, well, am I giving the patient the best treatment for them or am I simply doing something because I like it or not doing something else because I don't like it? So communication is important. And then finally, context of where we're going to do this and when we're going to do it, you know, that can you know, affect outcomes. So things such as posters, model, privacy, you know, you know, they're not comfortable having, you know, being stripped down to their underwear just behind a curtain when there's a gap in the curtain and, and, and the next cubital is visible. Whereas if you did it in a room, it may be more appropriate. The colour, the light sources, you know, is the bright light. So we've got one treatment room where somebody lies on their back, I put the wall lights on, I put the overhead lights off. You know, simple things like this can can have 
an effect, a small effect, but that effect is ongoing throughout the treatment. Okay, so traditional manual therapy then is reliant on things such as palpation skills, this pathomechanical model we talked about, upslip, downslip, stiff, AP, etc., etc., and specificity of techniques. So I'm manipulating L3 rather than L4. Modern manual therapy, then contemporary manual therapy, is more humanistic in its principles. What uh, you know, how are we achieving that result? So the total treatment rather than just our hands touching the patient. We're much more focused on the patient themselves, but we're still using that safety net of, of clinical reasoning. We need to recognize that as a profession, we need to change and that can be positive. But for some individuals, if they've spent their whole lives doing a particular technique, we have to respect that it may be difficult for them to evolve. You know, if you've been driving, driving petrol cars for 40 years, it's not going to be easy to drive an electric one. Or it might be incredibly easy and you might love it. You're looking for something to, to, to move on to. All right, so if we take this as a, an example, this is a typical mobilization. So we can do mobilization of knee or the hip or the sacroiliac joint or whatever. We can use that with hands, with belts, all sorts of different things. And traditionally, we'd say, well, we need to be in an open pack position, flexion, abduction, external rotation. We're grasping the foot or we're grasping the belt. We're using a figure of eight to, to reduce the um, skin con or increase the skin contact that re reduce the skin irritation and we're using something that the patient does so we say shorten your leg and then allow your leg to lengthen so we're using a muscle energy technique so that would be a typical example of that and that in itself is fine you know there's nothing wrong with that but I would need to be able to say well okay can I change it for myself to make it more comfortable can I change it for the patient to make it more comfortable? Is it efficient? Has it achieved its results? What is the communication that I'm using with that? You know, you could use this technique yourself. So all I'm doing is putting a little bit of traction through. How about holding the high bar in the gym and putting a little bit of traction through your own leg? So it's only the weight of your leg, but, you know, it's still going to do something. So we're involving our, our patients in our treatment. So what we what we have to do then is there's a lovely English phrase which is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we're not saying we're not going to use manual therapy ever again. We're not going to say we're going to use every simple manual th therapy technique ever described. What we're going to say is we're going to filter through those techniques and we're going to choose one or two techniques which we're then going to adapt and we're going to put them into a biopsychosocial framework to make that treatment more effective. OK, so contact details and bits and bobs there. Um, thanks very much for um, looking. These two books, my two textbooks, have elements of manual therapy and this one more related to the lumbar spine, this more general, um, and you've got various different things on YouTube and bits and pieces to, to uh, chase those up. Thanks for watching.